Thank you, and hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar, The Smokescreen of Misinformation, Countering Tobacco Retailer Licensing Opposition, presented by Change Lab Solutions and the Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing. I know that many of you on today's call are, have worked with both of our organizations in the past, but for those who are not familiar with us, just briefly, Change Lab Solutions is our new name. Formerly, our organization was known as Public Health Law and Policy which included the Technical Assistance Legal Center, which has been providing innovative law and policy solutions throughout California for the past 15 years, helping to transform communities so that everyone has safe places to live and be active, and tobacco-free living. The Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing, our co-host for today's webinar, is a project of the American Lung Association of California. The Center assists local coalitions throughout California on their policy campaigns, by providing technical assistance such as policy information, policy materials, community organizing, and campaign strategy sessions. I'm Ian McLaughlin with Change Lab Solutions, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm really uh, excited to be presenting this webinar today on a timely and important topic. There's been a lot of policy activity in the retail environment recently, which is increasingly being recognized as the next frontier of tobacco control. And it's also an area where the tobacco industry spends a vast majority of its promotional dollars. During today's webinar, we will be discussing some of the organizations that have been opposing retail policies, and especially tobacco retailer licensing, as well as some of the arguments that they've been raising. Although there are numerous participants from across the nation on today's webinar that have also encountered these opposition groups and these arguments, this webinar today is really focused on the arguments and the industry presence that we have seen in California, and it's intended for a California audience, so we will really be focusing on our experience here. Throughout the webinar, if you have a question, we would urge you to use the chat box to type your question in. The chat box is on the lower left-hand corner of your screen, and if you type your message at the bottom, you can send it, and all of the co-presenters on today's webinar will be able to see them. We will try and answer as many questions as we can, either through the chat function or we will ask some of the questions to the presenters as well. So here is an overview of what we're going to be talking about on the webinar today. After this introduction, we're going to go into a brief presentation where we're going to meet some of the opposition groups and hear a little bit more about them, how they were formed and how they came to be present in California. We're also going to hear a couple of stories from the field, from Fresno and Santa Clara County, about how these industry opposition groups have shown up at various legislative meetings in those areas. Then we're going to talk about some of the specific opposition arguments that have been raised and discuss some responses and rebuttals to those arguments. And finally, we're going to go through uh, some resources that are available in order to help you in your policy work. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Vanessa Marvin, who will kick us off. Vanessa is the Advocacy Director for the American Lung Association in California and serves as the Director for the Center. Vanessa has worked with the Lung Association over the past 10 years to provide technical assistance and training to local tobacco control coalitions throughout California, many working on campaigns in the retail environment. Vanessa will kick us off by discussing the importance of coalition building, which is an issue that really cuts across all of our work and is equally important here. Vanessa? Thanks, Ian. Hi, everyone. So as Ian said, um, the majority of this call, or a good portion of this call, is really going to be focused on the arguments that some of these opposition groups are making in communities um, to oppose licensing and other retail policies. And that's because we really want you to feel as prepared as possible and really confident to answer those tough questions that we're getting um, from the opposition groups. But before we get to that, we want to spend a couple moments here at the beginning of the call really talking about the fact that even though we're putting an emphasis on this call on knowing the policy answers, oftentimes knowing the policy answers isn't enough. You really need to make sure you have the advocacy and community organizing backing to go along with your campaign. And whenever I think about this, I uh, remember back to a meeting I went to last fall. It was a city in Santa Clara County, and the city was considering a tobacco retail licensing policy and restricting sales near schools. So the city council sent their staff person out to hold a town hall type session to get public input into the process. So on some random Tuesday night, I headed out to the senior center 
um, for the meeting, and I was there, you know, with representing the American Lung Association, and there was a volunteer there from the American Cancer Society. And also there were 15 retailers and two representatives from the Neighborhood Market Association. So it didn't matter in that meeting that the volunteer and I knew why this wasn't a takings. It didn't matter that we knew the fee wouldn't be a burden on the retailer. It didn't even matter that we knew that the staff person agreed with us. What really mattered in the end was those retailers showing up, they were organizing, they were building political support that would ultimately kill the ordinance. So you know, we want to take a moment here to remember, remind you guys and remember that we really need to build the political support for these campaigns. It's not enough to have the right answers to these questions. And we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about this, uh, about community organizing on this call. You've probably heard it all before. And if not, you can give me a call and I can talk to you uh, separately. But you know, we really need to have the support of business leaders, community leaders, people who are connected with the city council members, people who live in the city council members' districts. Um, you need to be able to have that backing with your political campaign. And we used to be able to get away with all, without all of the support um, in our tobacco retail licensing campaigns. There didn't used to be this kind of organized opposition to the work that we were doing. I mean, I remember going to a very similar town hall um, type meeting uh, a couple of years ago in another community, and it was just us tobacco control people sitting around in a room waiting to see if any retailers showed up, and nobody did. None of the 100 invited retailers showed up. But now we have opposition, and so now we can't take the shortcuts um, that we once could in our campaign. We have to make sure we're building those community coalitions that we're demonstrating the support we need to pass these policies. And I know it's not easy to do. I know it's very difficult to build community coalitions. To get people to come out for a town hall type thing is extraordinarily difficult. But we really need to take the time and really focus on that, not just on the policy answers. So I'll leave, that at, leave it at that with just a reminder that you, know, you, know, you have to prepare the campaign and organizing side of things, not just the policy answers. And turn it back over to Ian. Thank you for that reminder, Vanessa. It's, it's a really important reminder and something we should never lose sight of, that we can provide all of the tools, like some of the tools we'll be talking about today, but those are just that, tools to be used in your own campaigns and building your own coalitions in this work. So they really are to be used, and there's no replacement for, for that coalition building and that campaign organizing. Okay, with that, I would like to get into the meat of today's webinar, which is really talking about some of the opposition that we've seen here in California to tobacco retailer licensing policies and retail policies. And to start that, I'd like to invite Lindsay Freitas on the line to talk about some of the organizations that have been actively opposing licensing throughout California and give us an overview of what those organizations, uh, how they came to be. Lindsay is the policy manager for the center, and she is responsible for providing regular tobacco policy and legislative updates, providing technical assistance to the tobacco control field, and creating tobacco policy materials. So Lindsay? Thanks, Ian. Um, as you guys probably know, the tobacco industry has a long history of using money and power to influence politics and policy decisions, and that is especially true here in California, where the, most of that time and money is spent at the Capitol. As you can see, in the past 10 years, they have spent $90 million in contributions and lobbying fees in California to influence these policies. Um, at this level, the tobacco industry often works behind the scenes, um, meeting in offices, speaking with people outside of committee hearings, and forego actually testifying on bills. Um, and that's a really interesting, significant thing, because it's just another example of them kind of working through and behind the scenes. At the local level, the tobacco industry has a history of financing local front groups to ensure that their interests are heard, and oftentimes, um, they do this through making big donations to groups, and they sign on as members, partners, or board members in these groups to help influence things. These groups are often aligned around economic activity that does not explicitly align with the goals of the tobacco industry, but can provide some cover. Um, but sometimes the link is actually very clear. So. Um, as Vanessa and Ian mentioned, these groups have been opposing efforts to pass tobacco retailer licensing ordinances all across California, and I'm going to talk about three in particular. The Neighborhood Market Association, or NMA, 
the Cigar Association of America, and the National Association of Tobacco Outlets, or NATO. So let's start with the NMA, the Neighborhood Market Association. Uh, many of you may know this organization as the California Independent Gro Grocers Association. It represents family and independently owned grocers and convenience stores, many of whom sell tobacco products, and has more than 2,000 members. It's based in San Diego, and more than half of the board of directors come from that region. NMA represents retailers statewide, but because of the strong emphasis it has in San Diego, it has a strong focus there as well. NMA has a strong connection to the tobacco industry and to Philip Morris in particular. Um, it, Philip Morris previously served on the NMA board of directors and has provided $10,000 in general support funds in 2004. In addition, um, the, Philip Morris and RJ Reynolds have donated significant amounts of money to the NMA PAC. As you can see on the slide here, since uh, 2006, they've donated over $24,000 um, for the PAC to use on issues, uh, political issues in California. This doesn't include the $10,000 that um, Philip Morris gave in general support. And only two other companies contributed more than Philip Morris to NMA, and that is Viejas Enterprises and Crest Beverage Company. Um, NMA has opposed tobacco retailer license and sale near schools in Fresno, Santa Clara County, Santa Cruz, and West Hollywood. And it has been opposing these efforts in San Diego since 2004. The NMA has sent letters to elected officials attempting to discredit the youth purchase survey results conducted by the Tobacco Coalition, and it has also sent level letters threatening to file lawsuits related to the use of these youth purchase surveys. Other tactics used by NMA include organizing retailers, speaking at council and board hearings, and asking for delays, as well as submitting weak alternative ordinance language. Um, and in some cases, NMA has also attended local tobacco control coalition meetings. So now we'll discuss the Cigar Association briefly. Uh, the national, it is a national trade organization of cigar manufacturers, importers, and distributors, as well as major suppliers to the industry. It was originally established in New York in 1937 as the Cigar Manufacturers of America, but is currently based in Washington, D.C. The board is made up of representatives from cigar companies internationally. According to the bylaws, the purpose of the association is to provide government relations services to the cigar industry, promote the image of the cigar in the eye of the consuming public, provide statistical services to the cigar industry and in support of the corporation's image and government relation activities and act as an information clearinghouse for the cigar industry. Uh, there isn't a lot of information out there about the Cigar Association. They're uh, pretty private, and if you go to their website, everything is in their members only section. But we have had some experience with, experiences with them in California. They've opposed licensing in Linwood in LA County, and in the past have opposed secondhand smoke ordinances in California. They've also been very active at the state capitol recently, working behind the scenes in opposition of SB 575, that it, the bill that expanded smoke-free indoor workplaces. Uh, they, like I mentioned, worked behind the scenes and were successful in um, kind of hindering the progress of that bill. So now we're going to discuss the newest kit on the block, which is the National Association of Tobacco Outlets. It is a national trade association that represents the business interests of tobacco retailers around the country. It was founded in the early 2000s and is headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's active at the federal, state, and local level and historically has been mainly active on the East Coast but recently has expanded its efforts into other states. NATO has 109 members that consist of a mix of tobacco retailers, manufacturers, and tobacco farmer interests. There are also concentrations of marketing firms that hold membership, and these firms are based out of New York and California. The members are located in 19 states as well as Ontario, Canada, and have a heavy concentration in North Carolina, Virginia, and Florida. 
and the main goal is to address policy issues affecting tobacco retailers at the federal, state, and local level through the education of legislators on the potential economic impacts of such policies. Uh, NATO also hosts forums to allow retailers, manufacturers, and farmers to discuss new methods of advertising and other issues of importance to the tobacco industry. So, um, NATO has, also has a strong connection to the back, tobacco industry. R.J. Reynolds and um, Smokeless Tobacco Company each provided $7,500 in startup dues to help establish NATO as it was um, first getting going. And R.J. Reynolds received regular updates from NATO Executive Director Thomas Bryant on the progress of the startup activities during the initial months of operation. These updates included information on the recruitment strategies and how all the money was being used and what was going on. So it, there's a clear connection there. Um, furthermore, many of the tobacco industry companies such as Philip Morris and R.J. Reynolds and Lorillard are current members of NATO, and R.J. Reynolds and Philip Morris both occupy seats on the board of directors. Uh, their efforts recently have expanded. In February of 2012, so just a a few months ago, they uh, put out a call to their membership to uh, learn about any and all information they could about any local ordinances going on. This was an initiative that focused on the local level and wanted to increase its presence nationwide. It has since then become active in many states. Um, it's active in Massachusetts, Virginia, Rhode Island, Illinois, Maryland, and Vermont. And in Rhode Island, it has filed a lawsuit to overturn a ban on the non-sale distribution of tobacco products. This lawsuit is still awaiting a ruling, so it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Uh, NATO also tracks and monitors local and state issues, including tobacco retailer licensing. And in California, NATO has been tracking ordinances in Dublin, Gilroy, Morro Bay, and Linwood, and has been actively opposing licensing policies in several cities, including Parlier in Fresno County and Linwood in Los Angeles County. Uh, they collaborati collaboratively work with other groups to submit letters to the city council, and they threaten to file lawsuits similar to the one in Rhode Island. So these groups are all out there, and they're all um, really doing a lot of things. Uh, I know Ian will talk about this a little bit later, but we do have some resources available on the center website, which is center, the number four, tobaccopolicy.org, under local policies and issues, and tobacco retailer licensing. And we've got some fact sheets about NMA and NATO. So uh, turning it back over to you, Ian. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks for that great overview of, of some of these organizations. And we've had a number of questions come in, and many of them deal with uh, the presence of these groups in other states. And we will do our best to answer those questions via the chat box. But one question I wanted to ask of you, Lindsay, is whether you know if the NMA is a California-only organization or if it's also national as well. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, uh, NMA, as far as we know, is um, only focused on California. It's based out of San Diego and really has a California focus. Lucky us. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay, well, let's move on now. After that overview, let's hear from a few folks in the field that are working on different strategies in the retail environment and how some of these opposition groups have shown up in their communities. As Lindsay noted, these groups have been active throughout the state, but we're going to hear now from two different communities in California with their personal experiences, Santa Clara County and Fresno County, both of which have actively pursued strategies in the retail environment. So first, I'd like to hear from Fresno County and invite Melanie Ruvalcaba, the Impact Program Manager at the American Lung Association Fresno office, to relate her experience. Melanie? Hi, um, can everyone hear me okay? I'm not sure if my mute button is working. Yes, thank you. Hello. Oh, okay, great. Um, I am here today to just share briefly with you uh, what we encountered here in Fresno County. Um, we uh, 
were pursuing or benefit or educating the uh, community of Parlier about the benefits of a tobacco retail licensing ordinance. Now just a little bit about Parlier. It's a very, very small town in rural Fresno County. Its population is about 15,000 people. It's about 98% Hispanic. They are uh, predominantly uh, migrant farm workers. Um, so it's a very small, tight-knit community. We did a YPS out there. Um, we presented the results to the City Council um, in November. And then we started educating the community and uh, collecting support from the community for this ordinance. In um, March, we had the first reading of the ordinance. And probably the very next day, the Chief of Police called me and said, Melanie, I got a call from this guy from NATO, not the good NATO, a different NATO. And um, they, are ha they have questions about the ordinance, and they say what we're doing is illegal, um, and, and what do we do? Who is this guy? And me being relatively new to this position, I of course deferred to my partner um, at the LLA. Big shout out to Layla. And she helped me um, do some research on NATO. Actually, she did most of the research on NATO and, and got as much information as she could. And once we realized who they were, we got a little worried. We didn't know why this nation, national organization was looking at this little tiny town of Parlier and questioning what a tobacco retail licensing was. And, and kind of, we, we were pretty scared. I was not around in Fresno um, when they pursued a TRL ordinance in the city of Fresno, but the NMA came to Fresno and was successful in blocking a TRL, TRL ordinance in Fresno. So Layla was familiar with how this works. So we worked together. We, uh, again, going back to what Vanessa was saying, we definitely g gathered our community support. We had the Boys and Girls Club director. We had some high school students. We had, um, of course, the county health department. Um, we had a public opinion survey that we had collected from the community. And we had huge, huge support from the chief of police. And I think that is what really made our difference. He was hugely supportive of this. And he sold it to the city council very well. And the way he sold it was he just said, it's for the kids. This protects the kids. Um, the NATO representative threatened to come to the meeting, the second reading of the ordinance. Um, and we were fully prepared for him. And he did not show up. And neither did any uh, retailers. Um, but again, it was quite scary. We didn't know what to do, so we, pre we prepared for the worst. Uh, I think we got really lucky. I think maybe when they realized how small Parlier was, they didn't want to spend their money trying to fly out and look for Parlier. But um, it just goes to show that you know, the only way they could have possibly found out about this is if a retailer told them. Um, so I think it just reminds us that we need to be vigilant and really garner that community support and have that community support, not just our fact sheets. We really need to have the community there speaking on behalf of the ordinance um, and, and promoting it in that way. So that's pretty much what happened with us. Luckily, the second reading passed. They, they actually didn't even have a reading. They said, we're just going to pass it. <laughs> and it, it took effect July 1st. And so we have a TRL ordinance in the city of Parlier. Thank you, Melanie, and congratulations on that success story. And I think that your story uh, really shows that we can expect uh, to hear some of these arguments and, and see this opposition uh, anywhere that you are considering a retail policy, a licensing policy throughout the state. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And now let's, let's hear another story from Santa Clara County right now. I'd like to welcome Janie Burkhardt, who is the Public Health Program Manager with the Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention Program for the Santa Clara County Department of Public Health. And Santa Clara County is another place where uh, there's been some opposition to retailer policies. So Janie? Indeed. Thank you, Ian. Um, am I off mute now too? Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so we, we did indeed have, um, we, we were able to pass a tobacco retail license, a really good comprehensive tobacco retail license in 2010. Um, for our unincorporated area through our county board of supervisors, we did have a lot of involvement from the Neighborhood Market Association. Um, Samantha Dabish was the, the contact we had who, who did indeed attend all our board meetings where there was any discussion of this. It started with a letter, at, at the very least, they had a letter campaign to all retailers in um, probably in the county, but at least in the unincorporated area. Um, they actually made visits to most of the retailers in the unincorporated area. 
they made the things that they, they particularly exploited were concerns about family-owned businesses not being able to, um, to sell their businesses and pass on a license, a retailing license with it, potentially. That any new license, that a, a license would not go with the sale of a business, that a person would have to apply again. And um, in our case, there was a grandfather clause. There is a grandfather clause to allow people to... Um, continue retailing even if they would not meet the new criteria around zoning, which require all tobacco retailers to be at least 1,000 feet away from a school or a place that children congregate and um, more at least 500 feet or more away from another tobacco retailer. So everyone who was um, an existing retailer at the time the ordinance passed um, received a license, but no um, no guarantee that that license would would go on in perpetuity if they sold it um, based on those zoning requirements. So that was a big issue. They worked up fervor in the retailers over and um, definitely brought to our board meetings that issue as well. Um, their other arguments were things we've all heard. Um, and a lot of the things Lindsay said in just a real basic description of the Neighborhood Market Association are definitely um, what they brought to us. Um, a license fee will be too much of a burden. These are family-owned businesses. You know, $400 is going to break them. Um, why penalize? We actually wound up meeting. We met with um, we met with the Tobacconist Association, with the Cigar Association, with a local lobbyer representing Altria. Um, that was part of our strategy that I think worked really well. We did meet with all the opposition. Um, so we did meet with the Market Association and. Um, the arguments were the same. Again, licensing fees going to break them. Why penalize um, retailers that are doing the right thing um, as opposed to just those who are breaking the law? Um, and, and then they really made a big push and, and got some attention from our Board of Supervisors around the issue that they felt retailers had not received enough outreach about the issue before our ordinance. Um, between our, our second, first and second reading when we were about to pass it, and they did actually succeed in delaying us slightly. So that is a major tactic, I think, of the organization in general, um, just to delay as long as they possibly can and hope that things go away, lose momentum, um, lose support, um, but that delay is their big tactic. So um, they had a little success with us on that, but we had great support from our board um, president, from the sheriff's office, from the community, local youth, um, making a good showing at all our board meetings in addition to Samantha Dabish and some of the retailers that she would bring and um, you know, matching T-shirts and things to our board meetings. Uh, so despite their, their efforts, it did actually pass. That was in 2010. Um, the other input we've had from the Neighborhood Market Association has been f between um, from 2011 until um, until early spring of this year, and through another grant through our Communities Putting Prevention to Work grant, we've been working with and funding uh, at least 11 of our local cities to try and work on on various tobacco policies, and that included retail environment policies and any of our cities that were funded to work on, I don't know how they found this out, but they found out every city that was funded for, to even um, look at potential retail policy, and there were seven of them. And uh, they visited all of them and talked to all of them, met with all of them, or almost all of them. In one case, actually, it got removed from an agenda and they canceled their meeting. The, the topic got removed from the agenda, I think, in Cupertino, and they wound up canceling the meeting. But um, all the same arguments there to the cities about, you know, you know, people are doing the right thing. Why punish them? Um, Family-owned businesses, this is too much of a burden. We are the neighborhood market association representing family businesses. Um, it's really the focus, and again, delay. Um, they always want to, um, part of their delaying strategy is we just want to talk more. We need more outreach. We need to talk more. We need to meet more. Um, we really want to work this all out together. And basically they just don't want policy and they want, if anybody does anything, just do more education on um, PC-308. Um, 
so so far they haven't been successful in our county, but they've definitely um, made themselves a, a presence anywhere that that retail policy is um, is being considered. I think that's everything. Thank you very much, Janie. And actually, um, I appreciate that you've run through some of the arguments that they've been using specifically because that's a perfect segue into the last portion of our webinar. And I think that your talk also shows how some of these tactics can be uh, very successful in at least delaying, if not stopping, potentially outright some of the strategies that uh, public health wants to pursue. So thank you very much for that, Janie. And now I'd like to move into the, the final portion of our webinar, which will be to really discuss some of the specific arguments the common arguments that have been raised against licensing and other retail policies by some of these groups. And we're going to be running through a number of arguments and another, a number of issues. And to help better understand and uh, discuss these issues, I'm going to be joined by Catherine Mungin and Julissa Gomez. Catherine is a staff attorney and my colleague here at Change Lab Solutions, and she is, focuses on tobacco retailer licensing and tobacco policies in the retail environment. Catherine is really the new face of tobacco retailer licensing at Change Lab Solutions. And Hulisa is the advocacy manager with the American Lung Association Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing. She provides technical assistance and training to tobacco control advocates on organizing, volunteer engagement, and strategic campaign planning. So we're very happy to have Catherine and Hulisa discuss some of these issues with us. But we are also going to be asking you in the audience, the participants, for your own opinion, attesting your own knowledge on each of these issues through a short poll question. For each of the issues that we raise, I'm going to put a poll question up on the screen and ask you to choose true or false, whether you think the answer is true or false, and click on Submit. Once you submit your response, you will be able to see all of the aggregated response from everybody who's answering the question. So let me walk through the first one with everybody. Here's the poll question, and it relates to whether TRL is necessary. The question is, TRL isn't necessary. We really just need to enforce the laws that already exist. Well, decide if you think that's true or false, and then click on Submit. And then you can see some of the answers pop up, and it looks like um, everybody really is answering false, because it is false. And this is one of the common arguments we hear about local licensing, that it actually isn't necessary at all in California. Retailers already have to get a license from the state, so why should they have to get a local license? Well, Catherine, how would you respond to that? Well, Ian, um, it's true that there is a state licensing law, but that doesn't mean that a local TRL isn't necessary. You see, California's state licensing law does not address illegal sales to minors. Rather, it prevents tax fraud. This is really important, but it serves a completely different purpose. In fact, California's state tobacco retailer licensing law specifically allows for local governments to pass their own local licensing laws as well so they can address public health concerns, for example. Well, that's a good point, but if I could put on my industry representative hat for a minute, selling tobacco products to minors is already illegal under state law, right? So law enforcement should just be enforcing these existing laws. The last thing that we need is another unnecessary law in the books. Isn't that right? No, actually. I mean, it's true that state laws make it illegal to sell tobacco to minors, but unfortunately they just aren't effectively addressing the issue of underage sales and youth smoking. Okay, for example, you might have heard of Penal Code 308. Well, this is a state law that's usually applied against clerks, not the store owners, who should really be accountable for the responsible business practices in the stores that they own. And also, this law has quite small fines. The fines actually aren't enough to be a deterrent, and they really haven't been shown to change behavior of the stores. Uh, the Stake Act is another example of a California state law um, that does address legal sales to minors, but it isn't being widely enforced in California right now. In fact, uh, I heard that each year they can only do compliance checks in about 8% of stores that sell tobacco. Hmm. But what about President Obama's federal law from a few years ago? I've heard that that addresses all of the issues you're talking about, because doesn't the FDA take care of everything now? 
Well, unfortunately, the federal law contains some gaps that don't deal with important public health concerns related to tobacco. So, for example, right now the Tobacco Control Act only applies to cigarettes and smokeless tobacco. The regulations don't apply to little cigars or other tobacco products like e-cigarettes. And some of these products, especially little cigars and cigarillos, are being aggressively targeted to youth. A local TRL is really a tool that communities can use to help bridge these gaps in the federal law. The bottom line is existing laws are often not enough to address public health concerns, and local TRL really empowers communities to impose meaningful penalties for illegal sales to minors. This will ensure compliance with existing laws, even when state and federal authorities are unable to enforce them. Did I convince you, Ian? Sorry, I was on mute. Here's the next issue, and here's the next poll question. I see that everybody is answering uh, false, that there doesn't need to be individual notice before a licensing law can be adopted. Well, that's one of the arguments that we also hear, that retailers are not given notice of proposed licensing ordinances. Felisa, how would you respond to that? Great. And, well, this is a complaint that we've heard from NMA representatives in various cities. They basically want to challenge the validity of the entire process and make the city start over again. But the reality is they're looking to A, delay the hearing, B, to try to make the issue away, and C, just to get more time to organize the opposition. This would be hard to combat if the city really didn't give notice to retailers. But most city council and board member board of supervisors always provide public notice about upcoming hearings and meetings and topics they're considering. So retailers have the same access as the public health community to find out what's going on. In many cases, elected officials make an effort to reach out to tobacco retailers when considering an ordinance that would impact their businesses. It's important that you try to encourage this, although it seems counterintuitive. Then when the NMA claims that weren't notified, you'll be able to remind the city council members that retailers have been sufficiently informed. The other side is to be prepared because retailers will probably be notified and be organized. So it's important to have your coalition members attend those forums and sessions, just like Vanessa mentioned in the, in the story she mentioned earlier. Thank you, Lisa. I guess it sounds as if adequate notice usually is given then to retailers. So let me move on to another issue that we hear a lot about that's very contentious throughout California, and that's about the licensing fee, which is really critical to the success of these programs. Here's your next poll question. It's illegal to ask retailers to pay an additional local licensing fee in addition to the state fee they already pay. And like I said, we hear this all the time. There's a lot of opposition to paying a local fee when there's already a fee that's required for the state license to sell tobacco. Catherine, what would you say to this argument? Well, it looks like our uh, participants in this webinar are pretty smart because uh, almost 100% of them had said that this argument's false. So actually, a local licensing fee is not only legal, but fair. As I mentioned earlier, the state fee in California funds a different program, one that prevents tax fraud. But local tobacco retailer licensing fees go to fund local enforcement of the licensing program. The fees often finance local law enforcement to conduct youth decoy operations or stings and make sure that the laws are actually being enforced. You know, businesses make a lot of money selling tobacco products, so it's only fair that these businesses take on the financial burden of making sure that tobacco is sold responsibly and that this isn't borne by the general taxpayer. Well, that may be true, but the fees are so expensive, that must be illegal. Aren't they just really a hidden tax? No, actually, the fee is legal as long as it covers the actual cost of the licensing program. Unlike a tax, which can be used for anything, the money raised from the fee can only be used to cover the actual cost of the program. And as a matter of fact, TRL fees aren't very con expensive compared to other licensing fees in California. For example, the California, a California liquor license costs over $12,000 with an annual renewal of about $582 last time I checked. So um, most 
local TRL fees I think are a few hundred dollars and really pale in comparison to some of the other licensing fees out there. Well, okay, but even if the fee is legal, it's still unfair. Creating a fee will put stores out of business, as this question says. Isn't that true? My stores, a lot of stores claim that they're law-abiding, they have checks in place to make sure they don't sell to minors, so why should they have to pay the fee? Felisa, what would you say to that? Well, I would say it seems that a lot of people got our poll question right, about 100%. So licensing fees are not a punishment, but rather the fees cover the cost of enforcing public health regulations. The fines and suspensions for selling tobacco to minors is punishment, and those are only applied to violators of the license. Retailers have a significant financial benefit from selling tobacco, and it's quite fair to require them to pay a very small amount to enforce tobacco regulations. And a licensing fee that is only paid by violators would be unsustainable. The funds would steadily decrease because fewer stores would be checked each year and thus fewer violators would be found each year. The whole point of the licensing fee is to have enough money to fund consistent enforcement to do compliance checks on most, if not all, the retailers in the jurisdiction annually. Just because a store doesn't sell to minors one time doesn't mean they never make an illegal sale. Well, okay, but putting on my industry representative hat again, I just don't think you understand. This law is really going to hurt retailers. The recession is hitting most store owners really hard, and now is just not the time to impose a new fee on any of them. The fee provision, I think, is discriminatory, anti-business, and will just be devastating. Retailers are going to fold. And you know that the city doesn't have the time or the money to draft a policy or enforce it. Well, Ian, I'm sure many of our participants have heard this one. It is probably one of the most common arguments that we've heard by organized opposition and individual stores. But remember, you are working to convince council members, not the stores. Remind the council members that protecting minors from the harmful effects of tobacco should not have to wait. The consequences of not protecting kids from from, from tobacco are far too great when 36,600 youth in California become smokers each year. The goal of tobacco retailing license ordinance is to provide adequate enforcement of state laws that would make it illegal to sell tobacco products to minors and provide appropriate penalties that include the suspension of a tobacco retailer license for retailers who break those laws. If a retailer abides by the law and does not sell tobacco products to minors, when they ha then they have nothing to worry about. A small amount, a small annual fee of a couple hundred dollars is not a burden on retailers who sell tobacco products. According to the National Association of Convenience Stores, 2010, 2010 State of the Industry report showed that in 2009, cigarettes accounted for 35.9 of all in-store sales and generated on average over 500,000 in stores per convenience store. Retailers actually worry about the loss of sales if the license is revoked for selling to minors, not about affording the annual licensing fee. But there are many healthy options of products that stores can sell as well. When it comes to restrictions on sales of tobacco products near schools, where we hear this argument as well, this policy only limits the ability of a retailer to sell a tobacco product. It does not prevent them from selling other products, and it does not force their business to close. As for the city not being able to do this policy right now because of lack of money, this ordinance is not an unfunded mandate. It brings additional resources to the city to help offset the cost of this new program. The licensing program includes money to help enforce and administer the program. In addition, there are numerous free resources to help the city draft and develop a program such as the ones that Change Lab Solutions offers. Did I convince you, Ian? Hmm. Well, those are all very compelling points, Lee says. But you can't get around the law. And my understanding of the law is that under state law in California, if you prohibit a business owner from transferring their tobacco license, it's against the law. It's a taking. This is something that we've heard all the time, and it's in the Constitution. 
If you don't allow retailers to transfer their license, that's unconstitutional because it's a taking. It seems pretty clear to me, Catherine. Well, it looks like we have a lot of legal scholars on this webinar because the poll results show that that's not true. Um, I have heard this argument before, though, from the NMA and others. But according to California courts, uh, Cal it's just not true. California courts have consistently ruled that a license isn't a protected property interest. So let me back up a second and maybe explain what we mean by a taking. So under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, the government can't take private property for a public use without fair composition, compensation. Uh, taking property without fair compensation is also prohibited under the California Constitution and other state constitutions. So this is what we normally think of as a taking, a local government coming in and taking private property, maybe to build a road or build a school. But like I said, California courts have consistently ruled that a license isn't a property interest. Therefore, the requirement that you can't transfer your license to another person can't be a taking of private property. Does that make sense? Well, thank you for that crash course in takings law, Catherine. <laughs> I'm convinced, but there are still a couple of specific policies that have been pursued that I'm troubled by. And the first one is about coupons. Aside from licensing itself, I have some problems with policies banning the free distribution of tobacco products and coupons. Those are important marketing techniques to secure brand loyalty that we use. So how can you restrict those, Huisa? Well, it seems like the most people on our webinar got this right. and. I would say almost 100% of them got it, and the answer is false. Although this is probably one of the oldest tactics used by tobacco companies, distributing free and local-cost tobacco products is a standard tactic as in, of tobacco companies to recruit new and young smokers and build and retrain a new customer base and loyalty. It is called sampling or non-sale distribution. In California, tobacco companies regularly distribute their products or coupons at young adults, at young adults family, and youth-oriented events. We often see them at bars, nightclubs, rodeos, festivals, and country fairs. State law explicitly allows local jurisdictions to enact stricter restrictions than the state on law on the sampling of tobacco products in order to limit the number of new youth smokers. Several cities have already passed these ordinances, including Chico, San Francisco. They've adapted strong local policies in this area. Hmm. Okay, well maybe you can do some restrictions on coupons, but what about those yummy little cigars, those flavored yummy little cigars? How can you restrict those or ban those? That's unfair, especially to low-income smokers, isn't it? <laughs> oh, Ian, it's true that some places are beginning to ban flavored cigars or those single cigars that are sold for 75 cents each. Communities are actually doing this because the Tobacco Control Act and other federal laws don't address cigars. You might not know this, but little cigars and cigarillos, uh, I have a picture of them, I think, they are created, they were created by the tobacco industry to be as close to cigarettes as possible without meeting the legal definition. And you can see that they look almost identical. The main difference is that little cigars and cigarillos are wrapped in paper that contains some tobacco leaf. But they can be the same shape and size, and um, the benefit for the tobacco industry is that they can be flavored. So while you can't buy a candy-flavored cigarette anymore because of the Tobacco Control Act, you can buy little cigars with flavors like grape or cherry. And while you can't buy a single cigarette or take apart a package of cigarettes, you can buy individually wrapped cigars that are sold for under a dollar a piece. And they're just not taxed at the same rate as cigarettes either. The truth is that communities are often just trying to ensure that little cigars are regulated in the same way that the FDA is already regulating cigarettes. I see. So that's for little cigars. But what about premium cigars? I want to talk about self-service displays. And for the participants, this is our final polling question. I see that we have 
Uh, I want to get everybody to see if they can answer this one correctly. Cigar smokers have every right to pick out their own cigars. They don't need a store clerk to help them. True or false? And this question really goes to premium cigars. Aficionados claim that the only way to choose a premium cigar is to hold it, smell it, feel it, and get to know it a little bit better. So the provision that prohibits self-service displays does not make sense for adult-only shops and premium cigars, and it really inhibits the experience of premium cigar customers who really want to personally select a product. Lisa, what would you say to that? Well, the purpose of requiring several little cigars and cigarillos to be packaged together is to limit the number of inexpensive, individually so sold little cigars and cigarillos which are preferred by youth. The tobacco companies really market these products to our youth, and usually, and usually they are the ones who buy it solely. A local ordinance that prohibits the sale of individual little cigars and cigarillos, requiring them to be sold in quantities of two or more, will increase the purchase price and help protect youth from the health dangers of using tobacco. So really, for the provision will not require retailers to repackage these products, and they will arrive in from manufactured manufactured prepackaged quantities, and the retailers will, will not have to break them up. So the purpose of it is just to make sure that when the, youth, the clerks are selling them um, to youth, that, um, or not selling them to youth, I'm sorry, and that they make sure when they're, um, it doesn't take it away, the feel or the taste or anything of that to the premium cigar user. So they just have to be packaged correctly, and so this is why... Um, this provision is important. Well, Catherine and Huisa, I'm convinced on all fronts on all of the arguments that you've put forth today. So thank you very much for those compelling rebuttals. And for the well, I'm glad we can be I'd so persuasive. <laughs> Indeed. Well, with that, I would like to just take a step back from these specific arguments and just let the participants know that we've chosen some of the arguments to discuss here today that we hear the most often raised against tobacco retailer licensing or other policies in the retail environment. But these aren't the only arguments we've heard. There are endless opposition arguments out there, especially for some of the different innovative plug-in policy options that we have for tobacco retailer licensing and some of the more innovative retail strategies. So if you come across any opposition argument, we urge you to contact either or both of our organizations to let us know what that is and let us help you walk through some of the policy and legal reasons why we think you or how we think you can move forward. Another issue I'd like to note on sort of a broader scale is to watch out for red herrings. Sometimes opposition attacks policies that aren't even in the ordinance. So that's another area where Change Lab Solutions and the Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing can help you, and that is to understand what is in your ordinance and what's not in your ordinance. Armed with this information, you can identify those red herrings, and if something's not in your ordinance, then there's no reason to address, address an attack on that. In addition, I will just speak from the legal side that oftentimes opposition groups raise the specter of litigation, which we, we know is um, always out there, and also that some action is illegal and that just saying that something is illegal will have a chilling effect. So we urge you to contact our organization, Change Lab Solutions, to help discuss some of these legal principles in a little bit more detail so you don't get sidetracked by false claims of illegality or red herrings. With that, I'd like to note some of the resources that are available from Change Lab Solutions in the center on tobacco retailer licensing and some of the issues that were discussed today. The Center has several resources that will be helpful for coalitions facing opposition on licensing and other retail policies. They have a specific document about the Neighborhood Market Association and the National Association of Tobacco Outlets on their website, which is www.centerfortobaccopolicy.org. These documents contain background information on the organizations, which Lindsay already covered earlier and some briefly, and the arguments that groups have made around the state. In addition, a more in-depth question and answer documented with other opposition arguments is also available. It's called Becoming a Policy Wonk on Local Tobacco Retailer Licensing. All of those resources are available on the center's website. You see some of them on the screen here. In addition, Change Lab Solutions has numerous resources as well 
Uh, coming also from the legal side, we have model policies. You see up there our model California ordinance requiring a tobacco retailer license. We have related materials that explain what's in the ordinance, how it works, materials on implementation and enforcement, and related fact sheets and legal analyses. We provide technical assistance on all these issues. Those are available on our website, which is www.changelabsolutions.org. So we urge you to not only reach out to both of our organizations, but to visit our website so you can download some of our materials on these issues. Here are our website addresses and also our uh, legal disclaimer, which is that the information we provided here today does not constitute legal advice. Change Lab Solutions does not enter into attorney-client relationships, and we provided this information for educational purposes only here today. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our speakers on the webinar, Vanessa and Lindsay, and Melanie and Janie, and Catherine and Huisa for leading us through some of the opposition and some of the groups and some of the strategies for getting around uh, these arguments when you're trying to pursue a strategy in the retail environment. So with that, I will say thank you to everybody for listening, and when you log off of the webinar, there will be a short survey that will come up, and we would like everybody to take just a moment and answer all of the uh, survey questions. So thank you very much to everybody.